Who am I? You sure you want to know? The story of my life is not for the faint of heart. If somebody said it was a happy little tale, somebody lied. I will never forget these words. With great power comes great responsibility. Who am I? I'm Spider-Man. Welcome to Now Playing's Amazing Spider-Man Retrospective Series. Can Spider-Man come out to play? Part of the Now Playing Marvel Comic Movie Series. The real crime would be not to finish what we started. Hosted by Jacob. He never lets anyone tell him that he doesn't belong there. Stuart. Do I uh, have web on my face? What's the deal? And Arnie. The whole thing was his idea. Ooh, my spider sense is tingling. If you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but if your spider sense is tingling, it's because this podcast will have detailed plot spoilers and mild language. So listener discretion is advised. We're gonna have a hell of a time. Go get him, tiger. Today we're discussing Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse, starring Shamik Moore, Haley Steinfeld, Brian Tyree Henry, Luna Lauren Velez, Jake Johnson, Jason Schwartzman, Issa Rae, Karen Sony, with Daniel Kalua, with Mahershala Ali, and Oscar Isaac, directed by Joaquim Dos Santos, Kemp Powers, and Justin K. Thompson. This is Arnie, co-host of Now Playing, and I love chai tea. <laughs> Me too. It's Stuart. You love tea tea? <laughs> and this is the co-host who likes to talk about his holes, Jacob. All these movies about holes. We had Ant-Man with the holes. <laughs> now we've got Spider-Verse with the holes. We're here to discuss if any of those holes are in the plot. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Ant-Man had a lot of holes. A lot more holes than what they were confessing on that blob. But yeah, I couldn't believe it. It's been five years since I saw Into the Spider-Verse. I mean, I feel like we say that with every (laughs) franchise we're picking up on. Yes, there was a pandemic, things got delayed, and now we're getting back there. I don't know, this one felt fresher to me. Like, even though I only saw it the one time in theaters, I think it was just because it was such an overwhelmingly positive reaction. I had so little hope when you said animated Spider-Man movie, I thought it was going to be some toss-off. You know how they make product just to tie you over into the next live action. I just assumed it was some TV animated thing. I didn't know it was going to be Oscar-winning, groundbreaking, animation-forward kind of movie. But yeah, my favorite Spider-Man. It's been five years since then and honestly (laughs) the mcu is trying to catch up right the mcu's got loki it's got no way home they've tried to jump on what was started with the spider-verse I got to agree. I'm surprised it's been five years, but I believe I gave Spider-Verse a highly, overwhelmingly positive review when we reviewed it. It has become my comfort movie. Like, if I'm in a bad mood, I watch Spider-Verse, and it makes me feel better. And they came out with a loaded home video release with an extended cut that has a Spider-Ham prologue and extra scenes, not all of which were completed, but allows you to see even more of the Spider-Verse stuff. I've just consumed all of it and love that movie. And so since I have seen it within the past year, it really doesn't feel like that movie was five years ago. It feels like that movie is very fresh because each time I watch it, I'm still discovering something. Yeah, it's one I've watched a few times since it's been released because unlike a lot of the comic book stuff, my girls really love the Spider-Verse movie, the animation style, the story, the relationship. So like, it's one that like, can we watch Spider-Verse? I'm like, sure, let's put it on. It's a great film. So I was really excited for this one. The whole family was excited to go back to the Spider-Verse and see this sequel. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and again, I want to remind folks, this won the Oscar 
Yeah. Best animated film. Like it because it's good. Yeah, it is. <laughs> and everything that wins the Oscar is good, but yes. Yeah, but Spider-Verse is good. <laughs> this one truly is groundbreaking animation. I think that was what really struck me about that first one was that because it had the mixed media style and took from so many influences, it just even if you don't care about superheroes or Spider-Man, you're going to like that movie. It's just a visually impressive movie. So yeah, I'm very game to come back and and the only thing I knew about it was originally this was called Across the Spider-Verse Part 1. And they've wisely taken away that Part 1. But I knew that this was going to be an incomplete story. That they were giving us a twofer. I did not know that. I guess I missed that marketing or that part of the news. Yeah, I'll, we'll talk about it when we get to the end. But total shock to me. Like, had no idea that was coming. <laughs> Yeah, total shock to my audience, too. I'll talk about it, but they were not aware. You were me in Fast X then, where I'm like, wait, there's no ending? <laughs> I was. I did think about you, Stuart. <laughs> I knew this would be a part one of two, but what I didn't know is that I'd have trouble getting in to see this. This is the first time since COVID that I have had to sit with people at my elbows. Dude, you just stole what I was gonna say. COVID is over because it was an almost sold out theater for us. Like what we do, because there's four of us, we sit on the side where it's like two rows of four and we get two seats in each. That way, like who wants to buy like random seats next to people? We get like two rows to ourselves. No, not this time. People bought those seats in both of the extra rows we got. We're like, what? There's people next to us? What is going on? We had forgotten <laughs> this happens at movie theaters. Right, yeah. It's not it was something I want to come back. There's a no. lot about the theater experience i'm happy to see return but not overcrowding i mentioned last time i was in this imax it was almost a private showing it was me and some dude with his feet up on the chairs i went to the same thursday at 3 30 show and it was pretty packed so that just should tell you how much anticipation sorry vin diesel more than for his east side writers people really want this I have to ask you guys, because you did have to see Super Mario Brothers opening weekend. Like, it felt that big to me. I don't know if it's going to make a billion dollars, but do you feel like the crowd was a comparable size? Like, families, older people, younger couples, like, it was everyone there. Yeah, in Super Mario Brothers, at least I was able to find seats alone in those first three rows. Here, I was in the first three rows the second time I saw it, and still <laughs> elbow to elbow with people. I, like you, I picked, like, one seat. There was one empty one, and then and a group of people. I'm like, nobody's going to pick that seat. It's like the middle seat on an airline. Nope, somebody picked that seat. <laughs> I saw this twice. I went Thursday night at 7. And let me tell you how crazy diverse the audience was. All ages, all types of people. And I ran into an old family friend, friend of my sister's, who's in her late 50s. And she came to this movie very excited for the film, bringing with her her 16-year-old son, who was also very excited excited for this film like the first spider-verse cross generations and has brought these families, all of whom, it's not like they're taking their kids to see the film. The parents are as excited as the kids. I went Friday night at 7, Comic-Con level cosplayers there as some of these Spider-Men, including like the Jess Drew Spider-Man, although not pregnant, and <laughs> Spider-Man, Spider-Man. A, I guess not only is COVID over, but you can now wear full masks in theaters again, which you hadn't been able to do since the Batman shooting. I mean, you were able to wear masks in theaters, but I think they were different kinds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Not over the head. And the audience gave these cosplayers a standing ovation for coming. And they were just so excited that they took off their masks to watch the movie. And somebody yelled, Spider-Man, don't wear glasses. <laughs> I'm sure one of them does. There's so many Spider-Men. I'll second that. My audience didn't have so many cosplayers, but super enthusiasm, like yelling at the screen, talking, and not just the kids. Yeah, loud men, grown men in their 50s, not me, but we're all like really like having an engaged experience. It was fun. I don't think it was the little kids of the audience getting excited over Andrew Garfield showing up, but like people were excited about that. So it was telling me like there's fans here, there's people that know all of these films. And so, yeah, it was a fun crowd to be with. And you know what? They haven't changed up the formula too much, except I did notice this is coming from a new directing team. Last time we had three directors and none of them have returned. One is a producer now, but uh, we have different people. I don't know what it takes to direct an animated movie. I'll be honest. I don't know how that really works, but different people at the helm, same writers as last time. So I'm expecting to have a similar experience and I'm going in fresh. Like I said, I haven't read about the plot. I saw one trailer, didn't tell me much. I didn't know what I was going to experience. 
I came to this as fresh as could be. I saw the trailers, but I have to admit, they focused mostly on Spider-Gwen and Miles Morales Spider-Man, and I just wasn't overanalyzing the trailers. I was just expecting a good time, but I was, I'll admit, a little disappointed because I kind of expected Spider-Man Noir and Spider-Ham to come back, Mm -hmm. you know? I was waiting for a cameo at least, yeah. Yeah. If anything, I was expecting the same movie, same cast of characters, you know, maybe even Kingpin again. Yeah, I came in with just thoughts of more of the same and that's not exactly what they're doing. No, they're definitely expanding the universe or the Spider-Verse, as it were. Arnie, why don't you give them the plot and we'll talk about it. It's been a little over a year since the events of the first film. In that first movie, the bad guy, the Kingpin, was using the tech company Alchemax to create a machine called a Collider, which would allow the transport of people from alternate dimensions. At the end of that movie, the Collider was destroyed, seemingly righting the wrongs of people being outside their own universes. In Across the Spider-Verse, we learn that's not true. The Collider, though destroyed, has left holes through which people, seemingly only supervillains, are being pulled out of their dimensions and into other universes wreaking havoc. Trying to police this is the Spider-Man known as Spider-Man 2099, real name Miguel O'Hara, voiced by Oscar Isaac. He has firsthand seen that when universes have too much tampering, it could lead to the unraveling of the entire universe, killing everyone within. O'Hara has created what is called the Spider Society, allying himself with each universe's version of Spider-Man. Together, they look for dimensional anomalies and try to right the wrongs of these incursions. At the start of this film, we see his Spider Society is joined by Spider-Woman Gwen Stacy, again voiced by Haley Steinfeld. Gwen's secret identity was revealed to her father, Police Captain George Stacy. When her father tries to arrest her, as Spider-Woman is a wanted person of interest in a murder, Gwen joins the Spider Society, fleeing her own dimension. So where in all of this is Miles Morales? He's been in his own universe being Spider-Man, again voiced by Shamik Moore. Despite his pivotal role in bringing down the Kingpin's Collider, O'Hara has intentionally barred Miles from being part of the Spider Society and even knowing of the Spider Society's existence. This becomes a problem when Miles faces down a new villain called The Spot, voiced by Jason Schwartzman. The Spot was one of the scientists who designed Kingpin's Collider. When the Spider team blew up the Collider in the first film, this scientist was transformed into a white creature with black portals on his body. Initially, he thought those portals only allowed him to travel through various points of space, but he soon learns his portals allow him to traverse the multiverse. The Spot is filled with vengeance for Miles' Spider-Man, as he blames that Spider-Man for turning him into this black-spotted freak. The Spot starts to traverse dimensions, looking for another one that has a collider machine. That would make the Spot nearly all-powerful, and then he would return to have his revenge on Spider-Man, which involves killing Miles' parents. O'Hara sends Spider-Gwen to stop the spot from causing such multiversal incursions, but as she still harbors a crush on Miles, she stops and visits the boy. This distracts her from her mission, and the spot escapes. When Gwen opens an interdimensional portal, Miles follows her in and finally learns about the Spider Society. The spot traveled to the realm of Spider-Man India. There, that chai-loving Spider-Man teams up with Gwen and Miles to try to stop the spot. But Miles wasn't supposed to be there, and he saves the life of a police captain who, according to O'Hara, was meant to die. O'Hara explains, there are what are called canon events in each universe, and those are things that must happen across all the universes in order to maintain their integrity. By saving this captain, Miles unintentionally began unraveling the entire Spider-Man India universe. O'Hara sends in a team to try and stop that universe from being destroyed. O'Hara then tells Miles another of these canon events is the death of Miles' father, newly promoted police captain Jefferson Morales, voiced by Brian Tyree Henry. Miles refuses to sit by and let his father be killed by the spot, so he single-handedly takes on the entire Spider Society in a massive chase. Miles finally gets to the machine the Spider Society uses to return people to their proper universe. Once back, Miles races to his home to save the life of his father, but discovers the machine transported him to the wrong universe. In this universe, Jefferson Morales is already dead, and Miles' criminal uncle Aaron Davis, voiced by Mahershala Ali, is alive and has mentored this universe's Miles into being a criminal called the Prowler. Prowler and Aaron capture Miles and tie him up, and we leave that story on a cliffhanger. 
Meanwhile, Gwen, disgusted with the way O'Hara treated Miles and O'Hara's Machiavellian methods, has created her own spider society, which includes all the members of the previous movie, like Spider-Ham and Spider-Man Noir and Penny Parker and Peter B. Parker, plus new members Spider-Punk, Spider-Man India, Spider-Woman Jess Drew, and the techie Spider-Bite Margot Kess. They're on a mission to rescue Miles as credits roll. Oof, that's a lot of plot. Uh, it's a lot of movie. This thing's long. I don't think I knew going into it, almost two and a half hours. Yeah, I was shocked when I got out of the theater and it was really super late. I'm like, oh, that was a long movie, I guess. Yeah, I didn't realize it either. And you add in 20 minutes of trailers and AMC welcoming you to the movies and all of that. Yeah, it's about a three hour experience. And I really didn't expect that from an animated film, which in my experience, animated films top out at about 100 minutes. And I read that this is the longest animated film. I don't know. Maybe there's some indie project art experiment that went longer. But I guess for a mainstream animated film, this is the longest. Mm Mm-hmm. I can believe it. But again, it's just helpful to remind you that animation for so many years has just meant kids. And this is not necessarily children's entertainment. It's not excluding them, but it isn't made for children specifically. And so I appreciate that. They're going to get started. And true to form here, I think that they're just going to follow the routine. We're going to remind you that there are spider Gwens. That the catch-up here is not with Miles, who I assumed would be the main character character, but his girlfriend? Are we using that word? How do we define where he left off with Gwen Stacy or Spider Gwen? Romantic interest? Yeah. They keep talking about connection. You know, it'll be stated outright later that they get each other in ways that nobody else does. They feel strongly tied to one another. It definitely feels like it could be a romance. She's suffering because of it. You know, she only had one friend and we're going to learn all about her Peter as we get reintroduced in a rock girl, riot girl kind of opening. Yeah, I really like what they do with this opening. She's kind of repeating phrases. It's just giving this film a rhythm. And like so much throughout this film, I'm like bobbing my head, going with the beat and everything. But you get that right away with just this monologue she's giving. And like she's always coming back to the same phrases. And it's just very poetic. Yeah, very different than if you go into a Minions film or something made for little children. Like this feels much more adult right away. It's a callback to the first film because the first film, all of those Spider-Mans, we get their origins and it's like, okay, let's do this again. You know who I am, all of that. And so like the first lines of this movie are, okay, let's do something different. And it's Spider-Gwen. But her origin here with Peter Parker being a picked on nerd, but her friend turning himself into the lizard and being killed and Spider-Gwen being blamed for it. That's all right out of Spider-Gwen's comic book origin. And she's a new her character in the comics. I think it was like 2016 or something like that, but they're being very true to her comic book origin here and doing so, I felt her comic book origin. I actually read that comic when it came out. I felt it was way too rushed. They did too much in too few pages, but here it's also rushed. It's all a flashback, but I really feel the emotion that she had with Peter. It doesn't seem like they were romantically involved though. They were just friends. Although I know from having been just friends with girls when I was a teenager that Peter was probably crushing on her. Yeah, they were going to go to prom together. We can see that very clearly, that Lizard attacks the prom. And he'll say in his dying breath, he did this because he wanted to be special like her, that he knew about her Spider-Gwen identity, at least and try to recreate it in the lab. You know, Lizard, not one of my favorite characters. I remember him coming off kind of wrong in the Garfield movie. Andrew Garfield, not Bill Murray Garfield. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, okay, yes. I I didn't think that needed clarification. But, you know, this one throws a lot in. There's probably a spider Garfield and spider Odie somewhere. There is a spider cat in this. Yeah, yeah, good point. But the emotion really comes from the fact that it's strained this relationship with her father. That Gwen now has to live with the idea that her dad, being a cop, is out hunting the, you know, villain, in his mind, that killed her best friend. And she feels a lot of pressure to come out to him, but can't. Yeah, I really like on the technical side of this because it's just amazing what they're doing with computer animation, but it just beautiful. Like it's almost got this watercolor feel, the backgrounds as she's talking to her dad and they change colors as they come together and embrace. It's visually fantastic. Like it sells the emotion. Maybe being so stylized might pull some out, but it pulls me in more because it's really selling like what they want you to feel at that time. 
I like what they do with the Spider-Gwen universe. I'll agree with you on that. But every universe has its style. And when you get them all merging, I do feel like it clashes. It's like you can wear your tie-dye shirt and you can wear your red Cardinals pants, but you don't wear them at the same time. And that's what this movie is going to do. And so a lot of times the animation style of this really irks me because there's just so much going on. It's just overwhelming, and I just sometimes wish for a little bit more consistency. It's something they did with the first movie, but I feel like they've decided the first movie worked, so we can go even more extreme with the second movie. I'll offer this. I feel like you mentioned watercolors. I feel like these animators, uh, clearly they have their animators, but they've studied the visual arts and painting, and it helps me know what universe we're in just intuitively. I'll never keep track of the numbers. There's a 42, <laughs> there's a 6120 or something. I don't know where we are numerically speaking, but having different styles to the different universes helps me orient to the Spider-Verse. I mean, come on, Arnie. Those Ben Riley jokes aren't going to land if they're not done in the style of those comics. Oh my god, those Ben Riley jokes are hysterical. <laughs> Voiced by Andy Samberg, by the way, in case we never bring him up again because he's such a minor cameo. <laughs> oh, we'll bring him up because I feel like there's a whole part of this where they talk nothing but uh, geek about all these different spider people. Right now, we're getting a Da Vinci <laughs> vulture that uh, Gwen gets called away to a fight at the Guggenheim Museum. She webs up her dad so that he won't get involved, and she's fighting what looks like a vulture made out of brown paper. I think this is from, there is an actual Spider-Man comic, like Shakespearean times. I think Neil Gaiman even wrote it. And so I guess that's what this is a reference to. They say there's an anomaly from the 1500s. So I'm guessing they're referencing that comic here. I absolutely love that. She's like, let me guess. You were sitting around having a cappuccino, a hole opened up. And the next thing you know, you were here. And the vulture's like, yeah, that's pretty much it. <laughs> Yeah, he's speaking in a heavy Italian accent as well. So it does make me think that this is Renaissance era, that this was essentially, yes, if Leonardo da Vinci, rather than, you know, paint the Sistine Chapel, made animated movies, like this is the universe he would have created. And it even leads to a joke that Gwen Stacy calls him a renaissance man, you know, <laughs> with that double meaning there. Again, the style of this vulture, though, he's hard for me to see sometimes. There's so much line work going on that he's almost amorphic. And it's really difficult sometimes to understand what's happening in the frame, even on my second viewing. Okay. It helps me think about those sketches from the Leonardo da Vinci, you know, like there's the famous one with the man that, you know, he's raised his arms and it's circular. I think it's a way of studying the body and movement. You know, that stuff is important. If you've studied visual arts, you know this style. And this style does feel in contrast to the watercolors. So what Arnie, you seem to be complaining about is what I think helps understand that this vulture should not be here. She should have her watercolors colors vulture and the fact that he's a da vinci sketch means that there's a multiverse problem well, let me compliment though the da vinci vulture design i mean i'm complaining about the clash of styles but i do love this vulture design the way they have taken those old style drawings and even turned them brown like aged paper i mean i'm pretty sure the paper they drew on wasn't brown when they were drawing it way back when but i do just love the retro tech on him yeah, he's throwing bombs and destroying a Jeff Koon exhibit, and they have some meta commentary about postmodern art. <laughs> Again, it's showing you how sophisticated this could be if you want it to be. The Banksy joke got a big laugh. That was the first big laugh in the audience. Yeah, I was proud that people got it. Yeah, I feel like, yeah, there were some art literate people in the audience, and that's cool. I loved that when they blow up that statue of the balloon dog, that inside are a whole bunch of other balloon dogs. <laughs> Yeah, right. Yeah, because who knows what's really in there? It could be. But yes, what's more important here, at least in terms of plot, in fact, this whole movie is about reintroducing us and meeting new incarnations. Spider-Gwen is going to meet another Spider-Woman and meet someone that we saw teased at the end of the first film, but now we're getting a name and an identity. Dark Garfield, Macho Libre. Or I guess you could call him 
Miguel. Yeah, Spider-Man 2099. I think I mentioned this at the end of the last podcast. One of my favorite Spider-Men created by Peter David, one of my favorite comic writers back in like 1992 or 93. Oh, you know it was the 90s if they're going 2099. We're going to have a Spider-Man that like got addicted to drugs and like, yeah. Yeah. So 90s extreme comic. Yeah. That sounds right. And millennial obsessed, like a hundred years in the future. Okay. Yeah. I know a hundred years in the future. And now I'm like, you know, 2099 is going to be coming. That feels like it's very close. (laughs) It kind of does. But I want to say I love him in this movie too. Oscar Isaac is so well cast as this character being the hard edged Spider-Man, the more militaristic Machiavellian Spider-Man that has to be in charge and make the hard choices about what's going to happen. Right here from the beginning, I'm being really impressed with his work, although he's not the flashy one. This new Spider-Woman, Jess Drew, is flashy coming in. She's like eight months pregnant and riding a motorcycle and kicking ass. Very different than the Jessica Drew from the comics, if that's what you're expecting from that name. Like, I guess she did get pregnant, so that's canon, but I don't remember her riding around on a motorcycle. No, this is Jess Drew, not Jessica Drew. Is that different than Jessica Drew, though? Like, it's the same name, basically. Yeah, but there's multiple Peter Parkers, too, but they're different Spider-Men. Sure, okay. There's a Jess Drew verse as well. Yeah, apparently this was in one of the, like, Edge of Spider-Verse comics. Okay, yeah, and for your sake, Stuart and the listeners, they did a whole Spider-Verse, like, series introducing, like, Spider-Punk, we'll get to him, but I know they've gone through all of this in the comics as well, probably a decade ago or so. And I get that. As a layman, I understand that there are whole worlds that could go out and explore and see this. I think it's more impressive if you've only grown up with the Tobey Maguire movies and, you know, now the MCU incarnations, to know that it could be a pregnant black woman, that Spider-Man can have so many different visual representations is the point. I think that that's what the Spider-Verse is really telling us, is that broaden your mind to what Spider-Man could be, including being a man. That was the whole first movie, right? Anyone can wear the mask. Anyone can be Spider-Man. It was Miles coming into his own and becoming Spider-Man and overcoming that self-doubt that not only Peter Parker can be Spider-Man. Here, they're taking that to the nth degree. Now, I have a problem with that thematically in that if anyone can be Spider-Man, Spider-Man isn't special. You know, I feel like the more you have characters of the same power set, and Spider-Man is one of the worst. There are so many... Even in the comics, in one universe, there's so many people with spider powers. And I feel that waters it down and makes the original less special. But here, it's the whole conceit, so I'll give it to it. And I'd offer this. It's not like they're saying, go down the street and anyone can turn into Spider-Man. It's one Spider-Man per universe, for the most part. It's just, it can look like anyone in that universe. I think what Spider-Man's about is... The responsibility, that famous Ben speech, Uncle Ben speech. It's, yeah, anyone can have superpowers, but to be Spider-Man, it's different. It's about the responsibility. It's about doing things when maybe they're impossible and you got to figure a way out. Like that to me, like what is the core of being Spider-Man? Like I think that they're going to try to get to that and maybe break that a little bit. If I say, no, it doesn't have to be that canon. Yes, that is the interesting thing about this movie is the existential problem you bring up, Barney, which is if anyone could be Spider-Man... How do you define him? And they're going to try and say that there's a canon story that a Spider-Man must follow. And uh, does that have to be true? Interesting ideas we'll get to. Here, it's just important to understand that Gwen breaks canon by outing herself to her father. That he undoes his webs, comes in at the end of this battle. There's a police chopper that's crashed into the lobby and all this chaos. But they've webbed up Vulture. They're about to take him away. And she's out of spider fluid and has no other recourse than to take off her mask and show her father she is the villain he's been chasing. And just with what we'll know, according to what she will learn later on, part of her story, her Uncle Ben is Peter Parker. There's always a death of a close person, and usually it's Uncle Ben. Peter Parker was her death in her canon, but her father's Captain George Stacy, and we're going to find out another canon event is that the police captain also has to die. So she will learn after running away from him that in order for her to be a spider person, that her father's going to have to die too. 
Right. And there's already so much tension between them. They Given, I want to say, long movie and what might surprise folks, it certainly surprised me, is that a lot of the lingering is more on the emotional stuff. Like her giving him a hug beforehand, before this fight happened. They spend time on emotional beats that if you had the Hollywood mentality of cut to the action, make this more exciting, you wouldn't expect. But yes, they've definitely set up for her emotionally, trying to stay connected to her father is hard. And she just runs away. She's given the opportunity. Uh, I think you called her Jessica Drew. Uh, the Spider Woman has offered her to join them in the multiverse. And it's easier to run away than to face what happens next. Because Dad's going to arrest her. I think it's interesting. Even after he realizes he's still reading the Miranda rights, he's still going to put her in jail. Cops are going to cop. And this is 20 minutes into the movie that Gwen finally enters the Spider-Verse and we're going to switch our focus. So it is a long movie. They're not going to rush through this prologue. In fact, it's after Gwen enters the Spider-Verse, we finally get like Sony Pictures presents into the Spider-Verse, you know. Yeah, the opening credits. (laughs) It's a very truncated opening credits, thank God, because I don't want five more minutes of this movie to be all the names of the people in it. But yeah, we're spending an entire act of the movie with Spider-Gwen and her story, which makes me think this is going to be Spider-Gwen's movie. And she's going to be a strong supporting character, but it's not her movie. It is still going to very much be Miles Morales' movie, even if we do have to wait a long time to get to him. It kind of reminded me of Star Wars, where it's about 20 minutes or so before we first see Luke Skywalker, and we spend the first 20 minutes with the droids. Here, we spent our first 20 with Spider-Gwen, but now we're back into the universe with Miles Morales. And like Stuart, I'm not going to try to look up all the numbers. I wrote them all down, but I'm not going to look them all up. 1610, if it matters. It doesn't. But yes, we're not just reintroducing to Miles here. We're also meeting or re-meeting a a character in the background. If you remember during a fight in the original movie where a bagel goes flying in a lunchroom and hits a guy in the head, that character matters, apparently. Hey, better integrated than Jason Momoa in the Fast and Furious universe. Like, <laughs> this person actually got screen time in the last movie. He did. He did. <laughs> Jonathan Own is his name, and he was just a scientist working for Doc Ock and was exposed to the Collider when it blew up. And now it has become a villain of the week, or so we are to think. He is just, you know, what Miles has to fight today while he heats up a Hot Pocket at a convenience store. He's going to take down this foolish spotted villain who's trying to take an ATM machine. What is it with polka dotted villains like that they want us to take seriously? The Suicide Squad with Polka Dot Man and now the Spot. They don't want us to take seriously. That's the point. But then they have these huge emotional impactful moments into the film. Like, yes, they're supposed to be a joke, but then they're like, no, but they're actually serious and they make it work. Right. Yeah, because anything, particularly this polka dotted, he's called the Dalmatian, the cow, you know. Are you a cow or Dalmatian? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, right. Yeah. It's like you don't look like a serious villain. You don't look like a problem I'm going to have to spend much energy on. It fools me because I also believe that this character doesn't matter. I mean, the fact that it's voiced by Jason Schwartzman. Yeah, I didn't recognize that it was Jason Schwartzman doing the voice. Yeah, well, first of all, Jason Schwartzman, cousin of Nicolas Cage. So at least we've got some familial relation going on here. (laughs) But this character, The Spot, I knew him from reading the comics, and he is a terrible comic villain to the point that they make fun of him. He joins a team called the Legion of Losers. I mean, he is a stupid villain with a stupid power who is made here into a much better villain. And admittedly, that's something they've been trying to do lately in the Spider-Man comics is take some of the silliness of the past and modernize it and make it less silly. But here, when you first see The Spot, trying to rob an ATM machine and he can't even use his powers very well. Yeah, he's introduced very comedically. Right. What do you do if your power is put holes in things? Yes, wisely, the way to disarm the audience is to make us laugh at him and believe that Miles is correct in quickly webbing him up and moving on with his day, not thinking about him, so that he will become so much more interesting and complex as his powers grow. Well plotted. But Miles is doing this just on the way to meeting a guidance counselor. I guess we're understanding he's now a sophomore at that special school that he got into last time. And Miss Webster, get the joke? Not all of them are hilarious. Oh, because it's a web. Yeah, at first I thought about that 80s sitcom. I'm like, no, I don't get the joke. No, it has nothing (laughs) to do with Emmanuel Lewis. Web, you put things with web in the title. 
But this is going to be a pivotal scene here towards his arc. The guidance counselor is like, what is your story? And she's going to try to push some false narrative on there. Like you're an immigrant and poverty stricken. And <laughs> I do feel like this was true. Like getting ready to go to college and you got to write these essays and like what's unique about you. And like you did have to manufacture this version of yourself for these essays. Like I really did relate to that scene. Yeah, not only that, but also the idea that the way to be acceptable, the way to get into Princeton is to pawn yourself off as something that's, you know, never been there before, as the outsider. Yeah, he's not an immigrant, as he points out. Yeah, that feels false for a lot of reasons and excluding, and you can see the hurt that it has on the parents as well, that both Jefferson and Rio were there early, on time, I should say, making excuses as to why Miles wasn't there on time. And they really are invested in his future until they realize, I think this is an interesting moment, that by going to Princeton, he's talking about leaving them in Brooklyn behind. And this is going to be his arc, is to break away from parental figures, to break away from authority figures, to find his own path. He's going to say it here. He's going to state his arc that he wants here, which is he can learn the things he wants to learn, but he can't do it in Brooklyn. And whether he's rebelling against his parents' expectations, rebelling against this guidance counselor, pushing her narrative onto him, or later rebelling against Miguel O'Hara and his play for the entire Spider-Verse, this is his arc. He's later on going to say, everyone's trying to tell me what my story is. I'm going to choose my own story. And so this scene, while it does feel like comedic filler to add in, is really the emotional crux of the film. And I'll say something else about this film. I got a real Toy Story 4 vibe where you think that's a movie for kids because it's about talking toys, but that was all about like adulthood and like letting your kids go. And I do feel like for the parents in the audience, Audience. There's a lot of stuff going on with Miles' parents, all the parents. When we get to Peter B. Parker, like, he's a dad now. Like, there's so much stuff about parents and kids and their relationships and trying to let them go. There's a lot of stuff going on in this film that's not superhero stuff, which shocked me. Yeah, that's what I mean about the length. That you would think that in, you know, making an extra almost half hour to the last movie, that this would be, well, and they do. I'm not going to lie. They fill it with a lot more character and chase scenes much of the time is given. Here's my theory. Here's my guess. You could have probably told this whole story in one movie, but you wouldn't be able to linger on the pain of some of these poignant little real life moments. We wouldn't have this guidance scene if they had just decided to make one movie for the spot. And you talk about these quiet moments, these emotional moments. The animation here, I may not like all the conflicting styles, but man, do they do good with facial expression, facial reaction. You know, I'm so used to the Pixar, DreamWorks, CGI style. I saw ads for probably five more movies in that style. Teenage Kraken and the Elements or Elementals or whatever that's called. Yeah, there's some mermaid movie we saw a trailer for. And there is a house CGI style for most animated films. And this is not going to follow that at all, but it does so well in conveying emotion. At times, I feel like I'm seeing real people emote on screen. Mm hmm. Yeah, it has the power of mocap, but so much more visually interesting and sonically interesting. I'm going to give props to the soundtrack as well, because the score and soundtrack so good. Again, I said it earlier. I was bobbing my head so many times throughout this film. Oh, when Spider-Gwen was capturing that helicopter, the drum beats and the guitars of the score were so good. You know, I'm picking up the soundtrack. Yeah. Yeah. I listened to it this morning before the show. And again, it's such a crass thing. Well, let's throw a bunch of pop artists together and we'll just, you know, make a bunch of hits that used to be how you put together a movie soundtrack no beastie boys in this soundtrack right yeah no they're all very thoughtful and some of the choices are not top 40 and so again just really this movie is long maybe too long for the story they're going to tell that's my one and only complaint but it's not really a complaint because it's so beautiful to watch and experience i'm happy to go at this pace and spot has broken out of his restraints by the way and the chase continues this guidance counselor 
Rappler meeting is abruptly ended because Miles has to get back into the spider suit and team up with his dad, who gets called to the scene as well, and they handle the spot. They find out that going into his spots are portals into other parts of the city, and they wind up in the rubble of the Kingpin's collider. Really visually interesting fight that is not hard to follow when you have these spots that you put in on the left side of the screen and your fist is coming out the right side of the screen and Miles is becoming pretty smart in how to use those to attack the physicality that is the person, the spot, and not all of his holes. And it's action-packed, it's exciting, it's visually inventive. Best use of the spot ever, I dare say. (laughs) Yeah, but it's by this point when he's saying, hey, we're here again. This is where you created me. This is where I realized, oh, Spot is not a villain of the week. That wasn't just a way to get us to remember who Miles was as Spider-Man. He is a nemesis. It's his insecurity that Miles doesn't think much of him. But in fact, it does seem to be, this is the point where he ends up, he puts his foot out through a hole and ends up kicking his own ass into a interdimensional space where he now realizes having holes is actually a cool thing. That he can pop his head into other multiverses and see the cashier from Venom and see Lego, Spider-Man, and all of these places that really, again, just expand the world and make this such a visually surprising and spectacular vision. The cashier from Venom. I'm shocked to hell my audience knew who Miss Chen was because I barely knew who Mrs. Chen was. I said it when we did Venom. My wife loves those Venom movies. She applauded. Like, she knew who she was right away. She got super excited because she thought they were going to show Venom. They did not, though. And Spot does grab some, like, gum from there. And if you see, it's Venom Mint. So if you don't know who it is, there's a blink and you miss it reference that you're in that Venom verse. So is this movie part of the MCU? Because we saw Venom jump to the MCU. They referenced Doctor Strange in Earth 1999. That's the Marvel MCU. Like, yeah, it's all the same. It's all connected. Well, yeah, have your fun. You know, and I know the MCU is not a part of Venom. They are not acknowledging that beyond the little tease. I'm saying the Spider-Verse is connecting it all. That was the real hero all along, not the MCU. They have not made a Lego Spider-Man movie yet, right? It's only been Lego Batman. I didn't see the second Lego movie. They've done a lot of Lego Marvel shorts that include Avengers and Spider-Man. You can find them probably on Disney Plus now. They were on Netflix for a while. But before the Lego movie where Lego really cemented their relationship with Warner Brothers and DC, there were Lego Marvel movies. I love that there was a Lego Daily Bugle because that's an actual set they sell. That's a set you could buy. (laughs) I have it. It's cool. It's huge. Oh, it's massive. And oh, I love that set. And what's funny is you see J. Jonah Jameson there. I am 99% sure they're just using sound clips of J.K. Simmons from that first Spider-Man movie. They might be because I read, apparently Spider-Man Noir does say something. I read that they used archival footage for Nick Cage. He didn't come into a sound booth to record anything. I didn't hear any lines by him, but so I wouldn't be surprised. But I did notice, I guess these are produced by Lord and Miller who did those Lego films. So that's why this is showing up. Yes, yes. The screenwriters' names are also on the Lego movies. Again, is this just a bit? No, I'm starting to realize that as you say, the excitement is more than No Way Home, this is going to to unite the whole Spider-Man universe. That what got people so nostalgic seeing Tobey Maguire, Andrew Garfield, Tom Holland hanging out is just the beginning when you can have Spider-Ham and Indian Spider-Man and Lego Spider-Man, all the ways that they're going to combine the most obscure spiders in one movie. Really, I think it trumps the MCU vision. And I could hear my audience get really excited. That Lego stuff, they were really talking back to the screen when we see Lego Peter Parker go change in the stall and use that wrist cuff to talk to Miguel. It was exciting to think that we could have this mixed media with Legos and live action What's funny is I think that Lego Spider-Man is actually Lego size because when the spot comes in, he's like a giant. So I think in the Lego universe, people are all Lego size. So while part of me was hoping that Lego Spider-Man was going to be one of the Spider-Men we feature in this film, I think he'd just be so tiny running around. He'd be a tiny Lego man. He might have been there. We just didn't see him. Yeah, (laughs) I agree. But again, they are combining them all. That's not just a bit. And I think that's what kind of takes your breath is to realize, oh, 
you know, like, of course, you know, with the cynical media perspective, they're not going to exclude any fans of any particular phylum of Spider, but they've really found a way to integrate, you know, like you feel like whatever Spider-Man you love is here in this movie is a cool trick. But I'm here for Miles, and Miles is still struggling to be on time. That for some reason, his dad is getting promoted to be captain, but they're having the party before that happens. For script reasons, we need to have a rooftop barbecue to celebrate that before he actually has the shield. And Son is trying to get there with a cake. Yeah, he passed the test. They talk about he had to study for nine months to pass the test to become captain. As hard as having a baby, according to him. Mm. <laughs> Not yeah. according to Rio, though. No. Yeah. <laughs> but they're celebrating, I think, his passing of the test, even if he hasn't become captain yet. Okay. And having this big rooftop party. And I gotta say, you know, we had a lot of Spider-Gwen ruminating and quitting her band and things. And now we've got a lot of Miles Morales with his parents fighting on the rooftop. And there is a part of me that is like, can we get on with it? I'm here for Spider-Verse. And there is so much emotional, interpersonal stuff. It's good stuff. But I feel at times, especially in the first hour, this movie does slow too far down. I mean, it definitely slows down. And my thinking during it was like, oh, this really is a superhero movie that's like trying to go outside its genre. Like, yeah, you could have horror and Doctor Strange and the multiverse of madness. But like this, so much of this first hour, I'm guessing, I wasn't looking at my clock. I was enjoying it so much. But it's just relationships with a little superhero stuff peppered in there. I'm like, oh, this is really interesting that, yeah, where's the big chases? I'm sure those are going to come up at some point. But I was just really enjoying this family teenage drama stuff going on. Yeah, usually this is a filler until we get to the next fight. And I think it's a real surprise. I think, Arnie, you're correct in how strange it feels. They're coloring outside the lines in all kinds, of, literally and figuratively, these filmmakers are really testing what they can do in a animated format. And for me, after having seen the whole movie, at the time, I don't know if I felt like I wanted it to move on. I recognize that it felt lingering. I mean, again, it's beautiful. Like, the thing that's going to hold you is this fight between father and son feels so real that the cop dad raises his voice too loud and humiliates his son and he can't speak up and he so badly wants to come out to him as Spider-Man. All of this stuff, could we just have had a movie about that? I think the answer is yes, but it would have been unlike any Spider-Man movie we've ever seen before. And so if the Hollywood suits didn't want to make, you know, money by breaking it up into two, you would have never had these scenes or they would have been really short. Short, and uh, we would have just gotten to it. But because they are saying this is a part one of two or a part two of three, then yeah, it gives them the opportunity to animate teenage life. I have no complaint of it other than it does make the movie longer. On my second viewing, and this is one of the real reasons I went back, the second viewing, I appreciated it a lot more. Right. The first viewing, I was anxious. I wanted more mm -hmm. Miguel. I wanted more Spider-Verse. I wanted what the trailers had promised me, and we were getting so much of this familial drama that is good stuff, well animated, well written, well acted. It's just not the movie I expected going in, and so I was checking my watch. I'm like, when are we getting to the actual plot. Yeah, it's for us to make the adjustment. That's what I mean. Like, if you had asked me, if you'd stopped the projector and asked me in the middle of it, I'd be like, yeah, this is kind of going on long. But reflecting on it afterwards, I thought, oh, uh, it actually was nice to be able to take that breather. And it's also important to realize that crime fighting has become ho-hum. That is the boring stuff that we saw that Miles, in trying to get to this party with the two cakes, was like, oh, I got to stop and fight this roly-poly monster. Oh, I've got to stop and fight this shoe thief. You know, like, that's like the stuff that like, again, villain of the week, like nothing is special about this, but it's the thing that audiences are trained to come for. So instead we get, again, a really long sequence in which Gwen returns to his life and they have something that looks like romance. Love these scenes together. I mean, the two characters have such good chemistry. I have no idea if they recorded together or recorded separately. I don't know the behind the scenes stuff, but the way they interact, the voice actors are doing such a good job. I'm really rooting for their teenage romance. 
Yeah, I think all of it works really well. Their relationship, when the parents come in and Gwen calls them by their first name. And I don't know, watching this with my family, like it just felt like they were hitting all those different dynamics that different members of the family go through. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that she's from a different universe and that they're different races and all of that. There is a way of looking at this story and speaking to the now and culturally where we're at with multiculturalism, blended families, all of that. Yeah, I just think all of this stuff is so great and not what we usually get, not what we're trained to expect in an animated superhero movie that we have to stop and adjust ourselves to say, oh, I guess animated movies can do things like this. Let's face it, this movie's super woke. I mean, Miles has a BLM button. He does. And I want to speak to that because I feel like woke has become a term of being derogatory. But who wants to be asleep? Like, we all want to be aware and conscious. I mean, even people that hate the wokeism are claiming that they're already woke. So I think being able to speak to our times, I'm always appreciative. It's what makes formula movies feel fresh is when then they can capture the tension of the now. And in these scenes, I feel it. Yeah, because we're going to have Spider-Men of every race, every color, different body types even. They're going to go there. One with a handicap. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Right. And yet it doesn't feel like tokenism. I mean, the compliment that I can give is they're not just doing it to be inclusive, capital I, and virtue signal. This story, really, I mean, the meaning of this movie as we get into it is about feeling like you don't belong, about being marginalized, and who gets to tell your story. Such an important topic right now. Gwen's not here for Miles, though. It's worth pointing out that she's here on a mission. Your your plot summary makes that more clear. But she slips away for a moment while they're swinging around and, you know, he's grounded, but he breaks curfew to be with her. And they're riding on subways where children are licking windows. Please don't do that, children. I love that message. So gross. No, no. (laughs) I love that PSA. If this movie can work for no other reason, children germs. But yes, she slips away and help me out with this because I actually in one viewing don't feel like I totally understood she knows that the spot is working out of this high rise building this rundown apartment building somewhere and has put a spider cam on it to find out specifically what he's doing I was confused about that I thought she put a tracker on Miles earlier and was like oh because there's such an ominous feeling when she shows up I'm like there's something sinister going on there's some secret so I'm like oh they're tracking Miles but yeah then it becomes clear a bit later that she was scanning this apartment room with this little spider bug. Yeah, as I take it, her mission was to stop the spot. Yes. And instead of stopping the spot, she went and visited Miles and just put this tracker there so that she could stop the spot later, not realizing that it would be too late. Now, I gotta blame Miguel O'Hara for this. If you know Spider-Gwen wants to see Miles and there's a mission in Miles' universe and you have an infinite number of spider agents that you can send, sending Spider-Gwen is asking for problems. Yeah, conflict of interest and Ben Riley. Yeah, but I don't know that Miguel sent her. My sense is that it was Spider-Woman, and she's kind of played this mother role. Like not only is she pregnant, but Gwen at one point says, adopt me, and she doesn't really seem to have a mom. Does Gwen have a mom? Deceased, I believe. Yeah, okay. So yeah, so I feel like this, for her, we don't really have enough of Issa Rae's Jess, but I feel like she did this in the same way that Rio kind of lets Miles go be with Gwen of like, get this out of your system. I'm letting you have this one night to do this, but don't compromise the mission. Remember what's important. And apparently she does because, all right, so help me out with this. The spot is working in this specific universe to do what? His overall goal is revenge against Miles Morales as Spider-Man for creating him. Got that part. But to do this... He needs more spots. He needs more spots because he ran out of spots. Once he kicked his own butt into himself, he came out and he had no spots. Okay. So he had to go back to Alchemax and try to rig that system so he could get a spot again. And he does get one spot built. And then he has to use that spot to find another collider. Because if he can get in the collider, then he can have like infinite spots and be all powerful and then come back and finally be a worthy adversary to take his revenge on Spider-Man. Why is he in this universe where the collider has already been destroyed? Because it's the collider's destruction that made him. I don't understand why this has to be where he makes his lab. 
Just coincidence. Because he doesn't have a way to travel somewhere else at this point because he has no spot, so he has to use that lab. Okay, okay, got it. Because he was doing that so much. He was running around and traveling. It looked like it was no problem. But, okay, what I did not get from one viewing is that that potential has gone away. He doesn't really realize what he could do with his spots until he goes into himself. That's the big epiphany for him. No, I got that. But I don't think they underline enough that he's trapped without a portal at this moment. Yeah, I thought it was clear. They made lots of jokes about him not having spots. So I'm like, I get it. Not having holes. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I'm just wasn't attuned to those jokes. Anyway, that helps me understand. Here's the thing about the spot. He's going to disappear from the entire second hour of this movie. So it's easy to forget all of these little minutia about the spot. We're going to have one more scene with him because of Gwen and Miles' little dalliance. The spot is going to escape. Jess Drew, Spider-Woman, is going to give Gwen one more chance to capture the spot. And this is where Miles sneaks along because Miles can turn invisible. It's one of his specific unique spider powers. He follows her. They end up in the realm of Spider-Man India in, how would you pronounce that? Mumbatan? Mumbatan, okay. Yeah, Mumbai and Manhattan together. Yeah, I did not know about this Spider-Man. I had to look this one up and apparently they published like an original Spider-Man Spider-Man India comic in India, and then it later came to the U.S. in the early 2000s. But yeah, this was an original creation for fans in India back two decades ago. There was also a bootleg Spider-Man movie we considered adding to the retrospective that was made in <laughs> India, a Bollywood Spider-Man. But because it wasn't officially connected to Marvel Comics, we felt like we could exclude it. Maybe I would have learned something if we had, but I didn't know that we were going to do this. And yes, it's fun. The joy of the last movie was meeting Penny and Spider-Man Spider Noir and Spider Ham. They're going to do that with two new characters here in Mumbatan. Pavatir Prabhakar, who is, does he have a name? Spider-Man India is what it says on the cover. Okay, but yeah, he's obviously here and taking quite a lot of amusement at the fact that Gwen has learned that Miles has followed her here and that he can identify the romance that they're having. And I love how he introduces himself. He's like, I don't work out because I'm naturally sculpted and I don't want to get too buff. I don't have to try in school, but I do anyway. <laughs> I have this naturally perfect hair. I mean, he is just... I love the hair thing. Like, he does not cover that hair up when he's Spider-Man. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, that was a nice touch. This is voiced by Karen Sony, who is sort of the, uh, you know, lovable sidekick in the Deadpool movies, if you remember, the taxi driver. Oh, yeah. But, you know, we'll talk about canon. He's got a story that's very similar to all Spider-Men in that he has Mira Jane. She's the daughter of Inspector Singh. We see that he is Spider-Man because there are similar things, even though he lives in an entirely different universe. And doesn't say chai tea, apparently, because that is redundant. Because chai means tea. I've heard this debate many times, yes. And they do that earlier. It's funny because Miles says chai tea, but earlier he derided the spot for saying ATM machine, which yes. the M stands for <laughs> machine. If I could wade into this argument, chai specifically to me means a mixture of tea that uh, you wouldn't give somebody a green tea if they asked for chai tea, right? Like you're, you're starting an online war, Stuart. How dare you? There's cinnamon, there's cardamom, <laughs> like the chai tea is a specific blend. That's all I'm going to say. I'm not going to say tea and expect to get chai. <laughs> Yeah, I love chai and I hate tea, so take that. <laughs> so, yes, he's here, like, doing his Spider-Man universe thing. And they're all trying to get to Alchemax. So that in every universe, another constant is that Doc Ock is not here, but her company is, and it has a collider. Spot is going to try to put even more holes in himself. I'm not really sure at this point. Now that he has a hole to travel, he just wants to keep going to every collider and every universe. He wants to become all powerful and just hand wavy power comic bad guy go. But that's what it takes. It takes going to every Alchemax to do that. It takes finding one that has a collider. He keeps going from Alchemax to Alchemax, but not all the Alchemaxes have a collider. So he specifically is searching for the collider. 
Okay. Uh, all right. Strange. Yes. And while all this shenanigans is happening, he puts up a force field and keeps them out and they watch him zap himself, hanging out just because it's cool in the same way that Spider Noir is cool. Jacob, I was thinking a lot about you when Hobie blows in. Yeah, Hobie, they keep referencing her. Gwen's like stayed the night in his universe before and Miles is really concerned about that and jealous. Yeah, when we finally get the reveal, I knew about Spider Punk. I didn't know his name, Hobie Brown, but but I did know there was a spider punk. So that was, yeah, fun to see him show up. You talk about the different styles. He's got this real, like, if you look at old 70s, 80s punk flyers, back when you actually had to cut out things and then paste them and not just use Photoshop, but, like, he's got that real homemade flyer look. He's always got, like, these extended borders around his body outline and everything. Great look. I call that sex pistol font. Yes. Yes, that's a great way to do it. Sure, there's good shorthand. Yeah. And voiced by Daniel Kaluuya, who I always forget is a it because, you know, I've only seen him in things like Get Out and yeah. Black Panther. But yeah, doing a spectacular job of being almost unintelligible. You really have to work to understand what he's saying. My wife kept leaning over to me. What's he saying? Because yeah, he's just like, <laughs> it's mumblecore at that point. And a couple of times they will, throughout this movie, put little word balloons. Yes. I think a couple of times it's to make sure we know they're not saying shit. They'll put a word balloon that says shoot. I thought they did say shit one time. And then they <laughs> yeah. put shoot to like try to change your mind that no you didn't really hear that we got away with it with spider punk a couple of times they'll translate what he's saying like he's like i ain't got scooby-doo when he uses cockney yeah yeah <laughs> it means cockney for not have a clue he is so well written i expected to hate spider punk first of all i didn't know he was british but that he's against you know everything and he's you know when they point that out he's also against consistency it's just such an absolute punk gag that his style it reminded me you know what I was thinking is London underground, early 80s type stuff, but it clashes so much with everything and yet I love it. So I have a love-hate relationship with the art <laughs> style, but I love the writing and the delivery of the character so much. He is my new Spider-Man noir. He's my new favorite Spider-Man of the movie. Yeah. V. Oh, for sure. That's what he is because Spider-Man Noir, let's face it, didn't do anything in that movie either, but was so cool. We wouldn't have wanted to see him excluded. I feel the same way about Spider-Punk. He sits it out intentionally. He's not participating in any of the action because he's above it all. And we appreciate that and love the fact that we have a Mohawk Spider-Punk out there in some universe. He's stopping a building from collapsing, but not because you told him to, just because he wants to anyway. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, the Alchemax building is coming down. And this sort of creates, if this movie has a plot point, because I feel like most of this movie is just kind of set up for a story we don't get. But the big pivotal thing that happens in this movie is, and coming down, Inspector Singh is running to save a child and is meant to die. Because in Spider-Man lore, no matter the universe, the cop inspector always dies. And here, Miles doesn't even think in those terms. He swings in and saves the child and sing. And that has created a problem that's going to get him called to spider society. Yeah, I can't believe they're going to reference it that it's ASM 98 going back to an old issue of Amazing Spider-Man where Captain Gwen Stacy did die in this way. I never even was thinking that with this inspector character trying to save this child from the rubble. The thing that gets me is this movie is going to get really techno babbly with these canon events. Like this is supposed to be a canon event that happens in this universe. It has to happen in this universe. The fact that Miles stops this inspector from dying is going to possibly unravel the whole universe. But the reason it happens is because something from outside of the universe, the spot, came into the universe. So therefore, how could it be a canon event in that universe if it required something from outside the universe in order to precipitate the canon event? It hurts my brain. Because in time travel, it's already done. It's already written. That's how it's going to happen. It already takes the time travel into account. And not only that, but like if they had managed to stop Spot from bringing down the building and bring him to justice, something else would have happened that I feel like it's final destination. You can't change fate when it's your time to go. It's your time to go. I think more of the horror is realizing that these Spider-Men are just letting people die. Like, they're actually not trying to save everyone they can, which seems to go very much against the Spider ethos. 
And I love that I saw this twice because they're set up. There's lines said that I just ignored the first time. O'Hara contacts Spider-Gwen and said, there's an upcoming canon event. Be vigilant. And then Gwen tries to stop Miles from saving the inspector. And on a second viewing, it all clicks. This all makes sense now what they're talking about. The first time you watch this movie, it just washed over me. I had no idea what they were talking about. Canon event. Right, yeah, and I think that's good writing, is that you just layer things with, we're picking up on words, but not really understanding. Well, we assume that, you know, Spider-Man's doing what he's supposed to. He's saving a small child in peril, while another Spider-Man, Spider-Man India, is saving Mira Jane from going over a bridge in a bus, that which also happened in maybe a few Spider-Man movies. I can't remember. Yeah, I feel like that's a canon event for Spider-Man. Mm -hmm. Save a bus falling off a bridge. Here's the thing. If you're like us and you see all the Spider-Man works, all their movies at least, yeah, it can get boring to see these things replayed. I talk about them in terms of them being canon, that they are the things that help you define what a Spider-Man movie is, is an interesting concept and one that Miles is, you know, broken. And I do think if there's a reason to have Spider-Punk here, he's the one that cautions him. He's given a day pass and they're all going to get to go see Spider Society and meet Miguel. But Spider-Punk is the one being like, don't enlist until you know what they're fighting for. That I know from his comment early on that this is not going to be a good society or a good place. Yeah, and even when he's invited to go to the Spider Society, Spider-Punk's like, we're not going. And Miguel's like, wait, I get to go. And Spider-Punk is just so disappointed. It was funny. And yeah, this is where you get hundreds of Spider-Men. I could freeze frame this. There's yes. so many word panels that pop up for fractions of a second. I'm going to so frame by frame this when I get it on <laughs> Blu-ray because you just, you can't even read the words as fast as they flash card up in this. How many of them? are from the comics how many of them are created for this movie i'm sure somebody is going to write an article that will tell me that i will never know you have to read every comic <laughs> is spider eastwood the spider with no name from the comic that was my family's favorite one the, the fact that the horse has webs like coming out of his hooves <laughs> Yeah, Web Slinger and Widow. Yeah, the Western Spider-Man. I'm kind of partial to Peter Part Car. They actually have a motor vehicle Spider-Man. And that's funny because it is the spider buggy. That's the buggy, right? Yeah. Yeah, from early Spider-Man comics when, you know, I guess they thought Spider-Man needed a Batmobile. Web Slinging mm. wasn't enough, so they gave him a dune buggy that was mm -hmm. dressed up like that. I think the one that got the biggest applause, in part because I think this actor was supposed to play Miles Morales, Donald Glover shows up in live action. Yeah, huge applause when he got his little cameo there. And he's the Prowler. It should be said that he's one of the villains. They go to a villain lair where there's Miss Stereo, like, you know, the gender flip Jake Gyllenhaal and typeface. He typeface I loved because he says, go to Helvetica. And somebody says, that's <laughs> yes. bold. Bold, yes. Good font joke. They bring one of my favorite villains in, Arcade from Spider-Man and his amazing friends. I loved that guy who threw an arcade machine, got turned into like electricity, and he's in there. I just love these Spider-Villains. As for Childish Gambino, it had been rumored that they would bring Miles Morales into the MCU. And if you remember, and you may not. Yeah, I do. He was in. In the parking lot. Spider-Man Homecoming as a thief. And so all of that rumor was that he would be the Prowler in the MCU, that Donald Glover would be the uncle of the MCU's Miles Morales. So this is the fulfilling of a fan theory type thing. Uh, okay. You gotta give people their little uh, conspiracies, I suppose. But yes, there is a lot of spider people. I think that's the important takeaway when we get to Nueva York is that <laughs> Miles was told it was an elite crew that he couldn't join because there's only a few of us. And he walks into the lobby and there's thousands. I gotta ask, I saw Toby. I saw Andrew Garfield. No Tom Holland here? I'm guessing, you know, Sony owns the rights to all that footage of Andrew Garfield. So A, maybe Marvel wouldn't let them use the footage of Tom Holland. Or B, I would not rule this out. That shocker of shockers, Tom Holland will be a Spider-Man mm. of import in the next film. They'll have a live action Spider-Man in it. Yeah. Yeah, that's actually my theory on that, is that they're saving him. And Spider-Bite. Gets enough of a call that we need to know that there's a girl with a VR helmet somewhere 
that sends a Spider-Man around in hologram, but doesn't seem to do anything. So again, I feel like so much of this is setting up a battle we're going to get next movie. And that just, we meet characters just to get it out of the way, just to establish who's going to be the players. And yeah, another returning character from the earlier films. I thought he'd be a bigger player. I knew he was in the trailers. Peter B. Parker, the schlubby Peter Parker, who had kind of given up on life in the last movie. We see he's gotten thin. He's gotten back with Mary Jane, which is what had really caused his depression. And he's a daddy to, and this is from the comics, Mayday Parker, the spider girl. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, proud papa. You're right. It brings in this parental theme of like, he's got to show them cell phone pictures even when they're looking at the baby. The baby's right there, yeah. (laughs) Spider-Punk's going to applaud her crapping on society when she shits the diaper. (laughs) Oh, (laughs) Spider-Punk. But yes, the only thing that really matters here is all of this is just distraction and background noise. But the important thing is that Miguel is here to take Miles to task. He's going to tell him two very important things. And the first is, you can't change canon. And you, sir, have upset the Spider-Verse by saving a child and Inspector Singh. And we learn Miguel's own backstory. At one point, we saw Miguel watching old home movies of Miguel with a daughter getting frosting on his face and things. This is a very long expository scene, okay? And it's full of dense techno babble and two viewings. And I'm still trying to wrap my head around if the writers fully grasp their own realities or if they're just bullshitting. I mean, does it make any less sense than Loki? or any of this other multiverse stuff we got in the MCU. I was definitely thinking a lot about the time mapping of Loki. Yeah, it looked like they were going after branches and everything, maintaining the timeline. And pruning the branches, I thought of Loki as well. And that helps. The more you've immersed yourself in this and understand the multiverse, the more this is going to help. It's also going to help when you watch The Flash later this summer, you know? Yeah, another one. (laughs) But we're going to find out Miguel found a universe in which a Miguel O'Hara was married and happy. And this Miguel O'Hara is single and unhappy. Yeah, he's the only Spider-Man without a sense of humor. And so that Miguel O'Hara gets killed and he just replaces him which morally questionable, but you understand what he's doing. At least it's not like the prestige where he kills the Miguel O'Hara to replace (laughs) Miguel O'Hara or something, but he's going to try to take his place and have that family and have that happiness. And in doing so, that voided the canon event of Miguel dying and everyone in that universe, including Miguel O'Hara's daughter, was wiped from existence. Yeah, that's the one part where, like, you talk about hand-waving, like, oh, okay, so it just makes everything get destroyed. Like, I wish there was something more to it than that. But, yeah, you mess up this cannon and everything goes away. I didn't really follow it, but I get what they're trying to say here, is that if you change history, we've had enough movies about time travel, Back to the Future, what have you, you can really wipe out everything. To go into the past and to change one thing could start a domino butterfly effect chain reaction that will change things you don't want changed. I was taking this is fanboy rage like so many times with these comic book movies they changed this character or they did that like it's got to be like the book and this feels like a comic book movie saying like no that doesn't necessarily like like, we're gonna play with that idea of canon and having to be true to the source material there is that element but i want to bring in just culturally speaking where we're at right now with argument over history you know like i do feel like right now minority voices are not allowed to say standardized curriculum about American history. I mean, I can't believe I live in a day and age where we can't teach slavery, but like this is becoming topical. You're not allowed to teach in some states that Rosa Parks, the reason why she was kicked off that bus and got in trouble. Like, right. No, she was just a woman that refused to uh, move her seat and got kicked off. Like had nothing to do with race, apparently. Right. So this argument about canon, yes, it does address the idea that there are inconsistencies in the spider verse for consumers. But it also just, if you're not aware of any of that, like me, if you're not a Spider-Man fan, you feel tied to this issue and it feels important because it's drawing on the, the politicized now of teaching history. 
Or it's just a good movie because none of that occurred to me when I was watching it. I was not deconstructing the film to look at the politics of Florida. <laughs> oh, no, it's there. Oh, and so important. Really? Yeah. See, like, I feel like it was like, that's what this film is. This is what was hooking me. Yeah, this is what was really hooking me was to think about, like, Miles is the anomaly. The other thing that he learns here is it's not supposed to be you, which is often the messaging for the outsider, for the immigrant, not your country, not your story, not for you, not meant to be the main character. And for him to say, I'm going to tell my story. I am the main character of my life. So important. So cool. Yeah. Miguel seems really pissed at Miles. Like Miles caused all the problems. Like because Miles was bitten by a spider and that spider wasn't from his universe, Miles caused his universe's Spider-Man, Chris Pine, to die and all of these other things occurred because of that. Really, it's Kingpin's fault. Kingpin brought that spider here. It's not like Miles was screwing around with the multiverse. He's like, let's get bit by random spiders. And chose to get bit by a spider. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and same with an immigrant, right? But like they didn't chose to be in the situation that made them, you know, go to where they're going, but that oftentimes they become the scapegoat. And that's what you shouldn't exist. We don't want to deal with you. Not your story. You're not America. And I feel like that's the issue here. That Miles shouldn't be is everything. And the fact that he's black and Puerto Rican in Brooklyn. And does he have an identity beyond that? I mean, the fact that his mom's going to point out that being Puerto Rican is being American, like that is an American colony. <laughs> no, I, again, it ties so much into the conversations and the political discourse that I'm hearing right now that I'm like, this is the Spider-Man movie for 2023. This is absolutely important that we have this Spider-Man. And what's most pivotal for Miles, beyond all of this, beyond being told you shouldn't exist, is the fact that he needs to just sit back and let his father die, because that's the way things are. Who would accept that? Of course we're going to be on his side when he refuses to accept that canon storyline. Yeah, when we're introduced to Miguel very early on in the film, he goes, I'm not like the other Spider-Men. I have to make the hard choices. And here we're finally realizing what that means is he has to be the one to order people to sit back and let others die. And you have to imagine every spider person in the Spider-Verse has had to go through this at some point. Yeah. Right. I mean, even Gwen knew it. I mean, she didn't know it when she said goodbye to her father, but has come to learn that he's fated to die too and has just fallen into line. You know, like, I don't think she's happy about it, but she is not running back to her universe and saving her father. That will transpire in a different way. Maybe we'll get this more in the next film. I, I did want to know more. Why would Gwen go along with this? Why would, you know, Spider-Man Noir, all those Spider-Ham that I'm assuming they're going along with it too. Spider-Punk didn't. Yeah, but he was part of this society, but he quits. But yeah. So I do hope they explore that and show Miguel's point of view a little bit more. Like I feel that would make that stronger. Otherwise it feels, I don't know, like evil mad scientist. Like I just want to stop all this stuff. So I do want to know why Gwen would go along with this. Maybe she feels like this is just fated for her that her dad's going to die. And so she's accepted that. I mean, I think people internalize narratives and I think victim narratives are easy to internalize. She accepts that this is just, I mean, what are they told? Being Spider-Man is being uh, able to sacrifice. And so that means I need to be able to let my loved one go in order to play this important role. To back up their point, I agree somewhat. I said with No Way Home, oh, Tom Holland's Spider-Man finally feels like the real Spider-Man because they switched it up and did the Aunt May thing. But like, oh, okay, he finally went through that. I didn't say canon event, but he went through that pivotal moment that all Spider-Men do need to go through. So maybe I'm guilty too, but like, I do feel like that's an important part of the Spider-Man story. So I'm really interested in this saying, no, that's not. We could do that another way. I want to see how they're going to do that. And I mean, if you believe that it's going to bring down the entire universe, then you'd be willing to accept one loss. The needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. For sure. I guess if I understood more why that brings down a universe, then I would accept them by 
buying into this more. Mm -hmm. Part of the frustration of watching this movie now is we can't know how this story resolves. Sure. That we have to wait a year to find out what happens beyond a Spider-Verse. That's the title, is that we'll find out that it's going to collapse. What does that mean? I mean, I think we have that argument today. Like, what is America when we tear down statues, when we teach this part and not other parts of history? We're afraid of the change. We see systemic change as being a real threat. And there are some people that will protect that to the death. Including Miguel, he tries to imprison Miles. Miles has developed a new power that he can absorb energy and then shoot it back. And I don't know if he can do that in the comics or not. I haven't kept up. He didn't used to be able to do it. He had electrical powers, but yeah, I don't know about yeah. absorbing stuff. That seems like a logical extension. I do like Spider-Punk when he first shows up. He's like, you gotta use your palms, not just your fingertips. <laughs> use the whole hand. And he does it here. Spider-Punk's last thing is to be like telling Miles how to break out of that shell. And we're gonna get the big climactic action scene, which I want to point out doesn't have the spot. Our villain has become, or at least our antagonist has become Miguel O'Hara, not the spot. Which I kind of assumed from the one trailer that I did watch that Spider-Man 2099 was the bad guy. So yeah, all this spot stuff going on, I felt like, okay, that's there to kind of push the plot forward, but the real bad guy is Miguel. Yeah, I, I don't know that I feel like I missed him. If anything, it's an anxiety to know that he disappeared from the the India world saying, see you back home. Yeah. How is Miles going to get home now? Yeah. And, and Miles knows that his father's going to die. Like all of that, just dread of not knowing is kind of what's fueling this. And let's face it. There's just a lot of fun to geek out to, you know, like this chase is nothing but a series of like Spider-Man T-Rex. Why not? You know, sure. Was that a reference to Venom T-Rex from Old Man Logan comics? Or is there a Spider-Man T-Rex that I've missed? <laughs> They added a Spider-Man T-Rex in Edge of Spider-Verse. There's even a toy of it. It's kind of fun. It's got to be a reference, though, to Venom T-Rex from Old Man Logan. Right, like, yeah. It's had to start there. I don't even know what you're saying, but I did recognize 60s animated Spider-Man. He's bad. <laughs> I could do anything you can. Ow, my neck is stiff. <laughs> <laughs> and the therapist, I got to like sp therapist Spider-Man who doesn't want to hear about his clients complaining about dead uncles anymore. <laughs> That's probably all he hears about. Yeah. Or, or dead captains. That's his job. Uh, yeah. What this whole sequence really demonstrates, like we've talked about the first hour, especially all this emotional stuff, deep family themes, all that stuff going on. But now they're able to like, this feels like Lord and Miller, like wacky Lego stuff going on where we're going to do absurdist jokes and it doesn't take me out. Like all that emotional stuff still has impact and all this humor still has impact impact like they are able to balance all of this stuff so well in this film yes but when there's a joke my audience needed that joke because this is not as funny as the original Spider-Verse film because it is going to try to have that emotional weight. Yeah. So when there were laughs, I think my audience laughed harder than the jokes deserved just because they were so hungry for laughs. Spider-Man is known for being lighthearted and known for having quips and things. Doesn't Spider-Man India like even make reference? Like, do you think we use our humor to deflect the pain we feel or something <laughs> to that point? <laughs> he is the perfect Spider-Man. My audience needed this release both nights. And one of those is, yeah, we'll bring him back up, the Scarlet Spider, Ben Riley from the Clone Saga of the 1990s. I gotta ask, Arnie, you're the Spider-Man fan. Have you read the Clone Saga? You know they came back to the Clone Saga, like they decided to bring that back. Stuart, because you don't know, the Clone Saga was this 90s storyline where like they had no outline. I don't even think it ever got resolved because the sales were so bad, but basically Peter Parker wasn't the real Spider-Man. He was a clone of Ben Riley, who was the real Spider-Man. Oh, weird. Well, or something. They kept making it up as they went along. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I've read it. It did have a resolution and then they did bring it back and they brought back Kane and they brought back Ben Riley as a yeah. new type of Scarlet Spider. Again, it waters down Spider-Man that you've got Kane and Scarlet Spider and Venom and Spider-Woman one through five and Miles Morales Spider-Man all in the 616 universe. I'm going to get out of comic geek guy mode right now, but <laughs> okay. I have read the Clone Saga. I love the hoodie look and the spray painted spider of Ben Riley and Andy Samberg doing a voice so it's not really sounding like himself. I hated Andy Samberg in the early days, but it really came around with Brooklyn Nine-Nine, and I just love his, like, I'm catching you in my awesome musculature. <laughs> 
again, kind of like Spider Bite. They were lingering on this Spider-Man more than some of the others, so I know he's important, probably for the next movie, but it just seemed like a goth joke or an emo joke that he was just tortured. It is a deep cut. Like, that is one for the comic book fans. Okay. And Spider Bite, help me out with this. She's at the controls of the go home machine. Does she help Miles go back or does he go back in spite of her? She doesn't reboot the system. She hesitates. So I feel like she's maybe on his side or feels it's cruel to keep him there. She makes a conscious decision to not stop him. Yeah. She had the power to stop him and doesn't. So, okay. in a way that's helping him, in a way it's inaction. Yeah, I couldn't tell whether there was paralysis in the moment or a vote of support. To be determined. She's part of Spider-Gwen's spider society at the end, so. Oh, okay. I couldn't keep track of who was there, but we'll get there. Yeah, it should be said that Miles is going home, or so he thinks. Yeah, they have this machine for the anomalies where it could read your DNA and figure out what universe to send you to. So, mm -hmm. he thinks... Thinks it will read my DNA and send me back to whatever his number is. Not 42. I know that. <laughs> but yeah, but because the spider that bit him was from Earth 42, it's sending him to Earth 42. I figured this out. Even though, like, I didn't quite understand what was happening. I was like, he's not where he's supposed to be. There's something about the homecoming that feels off. When he goes back into his room, you know what it is? His mom says, what have you done to your hair? And that has you go, hmm? His hair has always looked like that. A real Back to the Future moment. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of stuff here that I noticed on my second viewing. Like, in the background of his room are the Prowler gloves, you'll notice. But I wouldn't have known to look for mm -hmm. that. Yeah, I didn't notice them. I didn't know he was in the wrong universe. My audience figured it out because there's going to be a point. I mean, first of all, there's going to be a point where Miles glitches. And when you're not in the right universe, if you don't remember the first yeah. movie, you glitch. Oh, that's right. Mm -hmm. I missed that. Miles glitches and my entire audience was like, oh, damn, they got it at that moment. Yeah, it's a really, I think, subtle way of doing it, but they got it at that moment, whereas I didn't really get it until Uncle Aaron, who died in the last movie, shows up and is alive and well and flush with cash that he obviously stole. I knew something was up when they mentioned Miles's hair, but I'm like, oh, maybe a different spider Miles made it to this universe or something like, yeah, I wasn't 100% sure what was going on, but I knew something was up. Well, I, you also know it because for his struggle, he's felt guilty. He's told us in voiceover this whole time for 16 months, I've been holding on to my secret that I'm Spider-Man. Will my parents approve? He finally comes out to her. And because she lives in a universe where there never was a Spider-Man, because that spider bit Miles, this universe 42 never got a Spider-Man. And this Miles consequently will grow up to be Prowler instead of Spider-Man. That's also the moment you realize when she laughs that what Spider-Man is that something from Comics Con? Yeah, when the uncle, he puts on those Prowler gloves, but he's like, I'm not the Prowler. I'm like, oh, other Miles is. And then he pretty much walks in. But I, yeah, I thought that was a great reveal. I couldn't figure out. So my audience was super hot at this point. Like they're screaming, oh my God, when they see Mahersha Ali's uncle Aaron come back in. Yeah. They're screaming. And one of them goes, he's the accomplice. Nop, it's one better better than that because yeah you think that, of course, if Uncle Aaron is alive, then he is the Prowler. That's the way it was in the 6110, whatever the hell universe it was. The normal one, the one that I live in. And yes, we have them going out for a job on the roof. And that's when you see the graffitied mural to Jefferson Davis. The father is dead, rest in power. How does Uncle Aaron know? Is it the haircut? Is it that his hair is not in braids? Is it that he doesn't know the job? I'm not sure that Uncle Aaron knows for sure because who punches him out is Miles. Like they're meeting on the roof. Oh. And it's Miles the Prowler that punches out Miles Spider-Man. Okay, I couldn't tell. All of this is happening real fast. And Miles wakes up tied to a punching bag. We think that Uncle Aaron is putting on the Prowler outfit. I know. Again, it's better than what we imagined. We're like, oh, he's the accomplice. No, of course. If you don't grow up having the spider power, you grow up being the Prowler. And this guy doesn't care that some dad in another universe is going to die. Why should I care if your father is going to die, Miles? We're not friends. I'm the Prowler. 
I'm not Spider-Man. There's something mentioned on the radio too. There's a cool moment where like sound gets drowned out because Uncle Aaron plays an old soul record. But I heard something on a radio about, I heard the word Sinister Six. And it sounds like it's J. Jonah Jameson doing the reporting too. Yes. Mm. Like, yes about this society called the Sinister Six. I, I think what we're supposed to get, but it's all happening so fast it washes over you, is when Miles gets to the roof with Uncle Aaron, he sees the cities in flames. The city is consumed mm. by destruction and that's when he goes this universe doesn't have a Spider-Man so I think what that radio thing is telling us is even without Spider-Man a Sinister Six came together and now they're running amok with absolutely nobody to stop them because there's no Spider-Man we're finally going to get that movie they never made that Sinister Six movie <laughs> it's this universe Interesting. It should be said, though, as this is happening, and it's a real shocker, Miles looking at himself and who he could be without a positive role model, we do find out that Gwen was also sent home, and she realizes there's something beautiful about not following canon. That in talking to her dad and patching things up, he just decides he doesn't want to pursue her. If his job is to be a cop, then he would have to go after the person that killed Peter. He quits the force and thus saves his own life without realizing it. Yeah, I felt like because he broke canon, because the chief never retires, they die or, you know, that's mm -hmm. their story. That's the but canon, yeah. He broke canon, so yeah, it teaches her she could do it too. It was a nice moment. And while we're watching Miles go home and talk to his mother and everything, we see him being followed. They're doing this trick of editing and, yes. <laughs> you know, it's like the Silence of the Lambs ending. The cheats you hate. <laughs> Yeah, like Silence of the Lambs at the end where you see the FBI storming the house and then the big reveal is they're at the wrong house. Here you have Miguel and Ben Riley and Jess Drew and then separately you have Spider Gwen because she got a wrist device that Spider Punk left her. And I love that his portal is like that cut and paste art style. Yeah. And they're all following Miles in Miles' universe, but they then come to the conclusion Miles is in the wrong universe. But mm -hmm. we are supposed to think they're hot on his tail the whole time. And they kind of leave us with the tease. There's no stingers. It's worth saying I stayed through the entire credits. No point. Nothing in the middle. Nothing at the end. But they're leaving us here on the hopeful note that all the Spider-Man that you loved last time, Spider-Ham, Spider-Noir, Peter B. Parker, is slipping away. He's lying to Mary Jane and taking the baby into battle again. We're going to get an epic Spider-Man versus Spider-Man melee when we get to the next movie because that's what Gwen has assembled. I didn't know that there was going to be, well, of course there's going to be a sequel, but I didn't know this one was just going to end. So yeah, a real Stuart and Fast 10 moment for me where it says to be <laughs> continued. I'm like, ah, mm -hmm. uh, that's a joke because they do jokes and break the fourth wall. And now we're going <laughs> to cut to the climax because I'm like, yeah, I've been in this theater a while, but I'm enjoying this. So let's do another 20 minutes and wrap it all up. And then the credits roll. I'm like, what? Like, I could not believe that. But the audience, I don't know, maybe they were better prepared. They all clapped, cheered. They loved the film. Like that was not a problem for them. Oh, my audiences, both nights, they never say shit in the movie, but there was said shit in the theater because somebody <laughs> just goes, this is bullshit. When To Be Continued comes up. Oh, no, no. 2024, baby. They knew the year they they were screaming, couldn't wait. Not my audience. And another person in my audience goes, I got to pay another $20 to see how this ends. This is some crap. My one daughter said, I'd rather have a four hour movie than she's like, what if something happens to me before I get the conclusion? I'm like, I went through this with the Avengers. Like it's a real anxiety. <laughs> I, I love your lives of so little drama that your biggest fear is death before a movie. I mean, look, there's much bigger horrors, but y you focus on the small ones. So you're not crushed by the, uh, yeah, existential dread of life. Yeah. Yeah. She's a teenage girl. I'm sure she has real struggles, but yes, let's focus on when do we get spoiled? Spider-Verse. When do we get beyond? Well, before we get there, I guess we got to get through this. Yeah, I'll tell you my audience, though, for all their cries of bullshit, when I'm walking out of the theater, they love this movie. Yeah. Even with their ending being, I hear them when I'm walking out, because there's so many people. I just get glimpses of conversations as I'm walking. I'm hearing things like, better than the first, best Spider-Man movie ever, you know, just rave reviews from my audience, even if they were a little upset by the end. Both nights, audiences just raving. But where do we come in? Jacob Stewart, do you recommend going across the Spider-Verse? Jacob. 
you know, I think it's important that people evolve in life. Like we never have the right opinions the first time around. Usually like you learn through life. There's lots of lessons you go through. And I remember way back. I don't remember the year, but whenever the amazing Spider-Man came out, that first Andrew Garfield film, 2012, 2012. Okay. So 11 years have been a decade. Let's see if I've evolved or if this is worth evolving. But I remember one of my big complaints with that was, well, they didn't want to tell me a whole story. So I can't recommend a, a movie where they don't want to tell me everything. They want to hide things so they could have a whole franchise and I was disgusted by it but it's 2023 like that's how movies are TVs are movies <laughs> movies are TV like so is this worth your time going and seeing even knowing you know we're gonna get an ending to it but not knowing how that ending goes you know it's Dune all over again we've done this over and over and so it's just something I have come to have to accept like this is the new version of media these days especially for big franchises you'll never get the whole story unless you watch them all but is this one worth watching yeah like are Artistically, I don't think it innovates anything from the original Spider-Verse, but it keeps up that style. It's hugely, massively impressive. Like, just technically, I cannot praise these films enough for being able to really do something with CGI animation and stretch it and, and not just do that same style you see in every Pixar film or Illumination film, all that. Second of all, like, this is a cartoon. Like, you think it's going to be for kids. Spider-Man, kids love Spider-Man, but it's very mature, especially especially that first hour where you're getting a lot of the relationship stuff. And I really enjoyed lingering there. Stuart, you're hypothesizing that all that or most of it would have to get cut out if they made this a single film. You're probably right. So I guess I'm glad this isn't a single film because I really enjoyed that. We had a superhero film that for at least half its running time didn't really feel that way. It felt like, yes, they have those superhero problems, but they also have real human problems that we can all relate to and go through and struggle with. So technical merits are there. The story telling's there the soundtrack is great like the only complaint is like i didn't get the whole story like i want the rest of the story but maybe that's also a compliment because i was so into this i would have sat there for like my daughter another two hours to watch the completion of this film so yeah you're not going to get the whole thing be prepared for that but if you enjoyed that first one i don't think this is better than that first one but it's up to par like the quality has not dropped so yeah strong recommend for across the spider-verse Stewart. Yeah, I remember walking out of the first one and feeling like that was the best Spider-Man movie ever made, and this one continues. It continues to be the most gratifying cinematic Spider-Man, in part because it is the most inclusive. I mean, No Way Home tried to play this game. Let's get all the actors that have played them in the movies and have a nostalgia fest. And that was a great movie, too. But this one goes into obscurities. You know, you're going to get Spider-Hams and, you know, Indian Spider-Man. Just They're able to just do so much more. Web Slinger. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you can just do so much more here in this format. And yet it avoids tokenism. It's inclusive, but it's not just, oh, we're doing Black Spider-Man. We're not just virtue signaling that it's what you've seen before, but in a different shade. No, it's directly speaking to the feelings of isolation and cultural inclusion that is the experience of so many American minorities. The way that Miles feels at school about does he fit in, is he accepted for his differences, is the same same way that his Spider-Man feels about the spider society and speaks to our educational system right now. The metaphors are really on point. And again, this is also just visually amazing. If you don't care about any Spider-Man, I still recommend this movie to you. It is amazing, spectacular, landmark achievement in animation. One thing I wanted to bring up, I just, we didn't get to it, but like, I loved how as the spot got more dark matter, he started turning into this Basquiat figure. If you know Basquiat, God. He was a graffiti artist from the 80s who like shook up the art world because he was like the lone black figure working in, you know, art Andy Warhol factory. And like, yeah, they actually take characters from his painting. This movie is just so well informed. Jeff Koons exhibit and all that. It just knows art. And so if you care about visual artistry, you're going to care about this movie. Like Jacob, I agree. The complaint I have, and it's a minor one, is that there's not any payoff here. And so I'm loath to praise this too much. Right now, Spider-Man is in mid-swing. He's got an epic pose. He's he's dangling there in the air and you go, look at him go. But if the next movie's not good and he does a face plant, this movie won't look as good either. So some of it is riding on how they stick the landing. And so without knowing that, all I can say is you've done a great job so far. Keep it up. I'm behind you, Spider-Man. So far, you got a strong recommend. 
And this is a definite recommend from me. I'm so glad I saw it twice. I was able to appreciate it so much more on the second viewing. But let me tell you, both times, while I think the drama is good stuff, I feel like this movie's pacing is a little uneven. I feel like the first hour focuses so much on drama. The second hour focuses so much on chase sequences and action. And when one is on the screen, I want the other. It's kind of strange. And there's these long expository scenes, like Miguel explaining the canon events and things. I've heard praise like this is better than the first film. I don't think this is better than the first film. I think this is a really well done movie. I think some of the art style I loved, some of the art Art style distracted me too much. It's exceedingly well written, though, well acted. And through my conversation with you guys, I've come to appreciate it even more. You know, by vocalizing my thoughts and reflecting, I realize I like this movie more than I felt I did while I was sitting watching it, even the second time. I think it's a movie that's going to grow in my esteem when I rewatch it a third time because I'll have to rewatch it right before going <laughs> yeah. into Beyond the Spider Verse. <laughs> I'm thinking about that too. Yeah. How much I will savor slowing down and pausing on some of those things. Being able to pause and yeah. <laughs> yeah. Prepping, studying this film for the last one. Yeah. So it's a definite recommend and definitely one of the best Spider-Man films out there. But I don't think it lived up to my high expectations from the first one. I think part of it is it just wasn't as fun. Fun. Despite having all these crazy Spider-Mans in it, which I thought promised, you know, even more wackiness than Spider-Man Noir and the Rubik's Cube and Spider-Ham with his hammer space. I did love that he explained hammer space. They did do a footnote for the vulture. <laughs> I just didn't have a huge amount of fun with it, but I respect the hell out of this film. Give it a solid recommend. And I am anxious for the next one. And unlike Fast X, they know what they're doing. I mean, we don't have to wait. Nine months. Yeah, under a year for the next one. If you're going to do this to be continued bullshit, you better have the follow-up planned. You better know when the landing is coming and don't make us wait too long because by the time Fast XI comes out, nobody's going to really remember what what happened at the end of Fast X. Here, it'll hit streaming in July. It'll hit video in September. And then in, is it March of next year? Yeah, that's what I read was March. Yeah, but you're skipping the lead. You're burying the lead. Before that, we get Madam Web. Aren't you guys excited? We are not getting it. I refuse to believe that is ever coming out. Bad Bunny, he ain't going to be no Spider-Man. Like, we're not getting, I refuse to believe any of those are coming out. We're getting Craven. I know Craven. Yes, I know we're getting Craven. Yes. But Madam Web and whatever Bad Bunny's doing, no. No, I've seen a picture. It's Melanie Griffith's daughter. She's she's sitting there. She's got webs. It's happening. It's AI generated. It's not real. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we have two not MCU Spider-Man movies coming this October. Craven the Hunter, uh, Aaron Taylor Johnson, kick-ass, will be doing that one. Not sure I know what that is besides he's a hunter. I don't know how you hunt Spider-Man and not have Spider-Man in it. It is like the Spider-Man story. I feel like that is the one everyone references. But without Spider-Man. What I find funny is, to me, this Craven's along the lines of Morbius, and there is a line in Across the Spider-Verse, a vampire superhero, yeah. I'd pay money to see that. <laughs> yes, yeah. Zing, I do appreciate that. This is just a Craven movie? They're not interacting in with Spider- Like, that's the only reason anyone cares about Craven. Well, it worked for Venom, and they're making a Venom 3. That won't come. People cared about Venom on his own, though. Like, I haven't liked any of them. I'll just go ahead and say Morbius, either Venom movie, Madam web i'm not anticipating yes i wish sony weren't doing this i think that you need spider-man and spider-man movies but you know what they've proven it's not just mcu that knows what to do with spider-man that i've loved the spider-verse so much i'll get through whatever craven the hunter and madam web is to enjoy beyond the spider-verse next march you say Sony has proven that they know what to do with Spider-Man. I'll agree, but Sony has also proven they are a wealth of shit ideas when it comes to Spider-Man spin-off movies that don't have Spider-Man in them, and yet they'll continue to make them and shove them down our throats, and now playing will be there. You guys recommended Venom 2. I don't know why. Yeah, no, the Venom movies are good. Yeah, I don't know why. They're not good. They are de they are the opposite of good. Uh, they're good in the way they need to be. <laughs> I mean, we'll have that debate whenever Venom 3 comes out.
But next week, another shit franchise. Transformers is back. You ready to watch them like in animal form, like piss on a fire hydrant and, and take a literal shit? I'm starting tonight with the animated film. I'm rewatching them all in prep. Oof. And I'm going to go back into this. It's not worth it, Stuart. Stop. I'm doing it. I'm doing it. Tell Grimlock about Bunny Story again. <laughs> <laughs> this is a canon event. If you watch all these again, the universe will end. Do not do it. <laughs> okay, well, you know. In the meantime, it should be said, there were two movies we needed to cover that opened this weekend. We're obviously covering Spider-Verse first because people care, but we still have the <laughs> Stephen King retrospective. And he wrote a little story called The Boogeyman back in the Night Shift collection. Yeah, we already reviewed it. We don't need to see this, right? We reviewed a dollar baby of it. <laughs> they didn't make a real movie. It's the 50th anniversary of that story. That story was originally published in 1973. Okay. And for the 50th anniversary, they have made a major motion picture of The Boogeyman. A short story I didn't really like all that much is now going to be, what, a hundred minute feature? Yeah. You know, that's the night shift curse. Like before that, he had real talents, Toby Hooper, Stanley Kubrick, Brian De Palma making his films. After Night Shift Collection, the whole vibe of a Stephen King movie changed. Can they break the trend and make a short story a worthwhile feature film? We will debate that. Everyone can hear that show. We are not doing a pay show on Friday. This Friday, everyone can get an extra show. Stephen King's Boogeyman will be available then. And then another free show, Transformers Rise of the Beasts. And just because we don't have a pay show this Friday doesn't mean we don't need your support. We're putting out an extra show as a thank you to our listeners who come time and time again. But we could really use your support on this show to keep it going. Our gold series is going to start next week as we go back into the waters with shark movies, starting with Open Water, a 2003 basically found footage but not found footage movie mm -hmm. that we're going to be reviewing. You can find details on how to support us through our Patreon or a direct donation through PayPal at nowplayingpodcast.com forward slash donate. We could really use your support. We've talked about some of the problems we're having with Podbean. It's a hard time for now playing right now. And if you can support our show, if you do enjoy our show and want this show to continue, we could really use your help. So thank you in advance for your support. And hopefully this Friday's extra free show for everyone shows that we appreciate you guys as much as we appreciate your support to keep us going. We love doing this show and want to keep it going. And we need you to do that. Here, here. So Jacob Stewart, thank you for joining me. And we'll be back on Friday because with great podcasts come great responsibility. It's all my fault. I drove Spider-Man away. Spider-Man was a hero. I just couldn't see it. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Now Playing Spider-Man Retrospective Series. It's good to have you back, Spider-Man. Part of our Marvel Comics Movie Retrospective Series. It's hip, it's now, it's wild, and how? Crawl on the World Wide Web to NowPlayingPodcast.com. You can find reviews of other comic-based movie series, such as The Avengers, Batman, X-Men, Blade, Ghost Rider, and Punisher. What are you waiting for? Chinese New Year? Go, go, go! We also have non-comic-based movie reviews, such as Star Trek, Rocky, Transformers, The X-Files, Tron, and many more. There are bigger things happening here than me and you. You will also find individual movie reviews such as Green Lantern, Cowboys and Aliens, Avatar, and Scott Pilgrim vs. The World. I am so loving this. Oh, me too. You can also follow Now Playing on Facebook and Twitter, where the hosts post new episode announcements and written movie reviews. The links to our social media pages can be found at nowplayingpodcast.com. I'll be there. Support from listeners like you help keep Now Playing operating. I'm going. I'll be here when you get back. You can find a donate button using PayPal at the bottom of our website, nowplayingpodcast.com. Everybody needs help sometimes, Peter. Even Spider-Man. You can also show your love of Now Playing Podcast by shopping in our store, where you can buy t-shirts, totes, boxers, coffee mugs, teddy bears, and much more. Looks uncomfortable. It gets kind of itchy. It rides up in the crotch a little bit, too. 
Now Playing's Spider-Man Retrospective Series is edited by Arnie. Misery, 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 that's what you've chosen. Now Playing Credit Narration by Brock. And I've never even seen his face. Now Playing is not affiliated with Marvel Enterprises or Columbia Pictures. Spider-Man and all that the Marvel Universe contains is the property and trademark of the Disney Company, and no infringement is intended. What are you, his lawyer? Get out of here. Let him sue me. Get rich like a normal person. The opinions expressed on Now Playing are those of the individual hosts and may not reflect the opinion of Venganza Media Incorporated. I missed the part where that's my problem. Now Playing is a Venganza Media production, copyright 2023. All rights reserved. Enough said. I, I, I don't know if this is going to make a million dollars, but do you feel like the crowd was a comparable size? Like I, families, older people, younger couples, like it was everyone there. I'm pretty sure it's going to make a million dollars. I don't well, know a million, about a billion yeah. dollars. A billion, I don't know. <laughs> it better. Well, like, that's what you said, Jacob. You said you don't know if it's going to make a million dollars. <laughs> O'Hara sends Spider-Gwen to stop the spot from causing such multiversal inclusion. Uh, Eight long plots. <laughs> O'Hara sends Spider Gwen to stop the spot from causing such multiversal inc- uh, uh, multiversal incursions. This is yeah. not easy to say. You could just you could leave that out. <laughs> O'Hara sends Spider Gwen to stop the spot from causing such multiversal incursions. <laughs>